All right, sorry about that. So this is how to create a reprex. You know, it's a little bit more art than science. And the book is so true in that if you take the time to do a reprex, you'll probably solve the problem yourself by working, by breaking the problem down to, the, to a minimal example of how to do it. So the book lays out some great um, examples of, of how to do it. And I'll just walk you through the uh, process. There's a couple of different ways you can do it. Um, so this is in the book, there's a, or in the um, Shiny Companion book uh, to go with this uh, book club. There's some great examples on this section of breaking it down into the components. And it gives you the examples of how it starts as a full app right here. Uh, but then there's an issue and then working, breaking the components down, the app down into the necessary parts. And another important aspect is to make sure that you are, um, you use a boring data set or a data set that's familiar like iris or cars and then um, um, also if you can't do that you know supply your own data and it gives some examples of how to do that um, i won't go into that explicitly because i think the book does a good job but like i said this is more of a uh, an, an art of breaking down the components of your problem uh, so that someone can help you so what they do here is they break it down and then we finally get here, but then they break it down even more. I don't know if I wanna run this, let's run it and see. So as we were talking about last week of how to read the, um, the trace back errors and the arguments here, I typically find that errors in the browser, usually pretty confusing and not very helpful all the time. But as you do more shiny apps, you'll find that you'll get a sense for what kind of error you have. Um, missing argument 10 is usually a missing error or a missing comma because that's what I'm missing or missing paren is my favorites. But I've just kind of learned to know what I was working on, and then if I get that error, uh, what the issue may be. But we talked about, if we look right in here, that gives you a clue to what your um, error is. So it starts out, and like Colin was mentioning last week, you flipped this upside down, but I'm actually okay reading it up. It makes sense to me. Um, but as you see, it stops at the validate slider value. And that's the, the issue. But the book goes through some examples of breaking the app down some more until let's see. And so you still see you still have the same error here. And I think with Shiny, this is probably the hardest part. Um, and like I always say, is it a data problem or is it a shiny problem? And uh, a data problem is a lot easier to solve for me um, than a shiny problem. But so now they've broken down this example this far. So I'm going to run it and so whoops, I guess that's the corrected one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Two. So we'll make a reprex out of this. And there's a couple ways you can do it. So what I'm gonna do is just highlight this. And I have an add-in. So you can use an add-in. And I'm gonna reprex the selection and it'll give me some options. Oops, I guess it didn't. So now it's on my clipboard. Let me expand that up here. 
So now in theory, you could paste that into GitHub or the Slack channel. And then someone would have a reproducible example and then they could copy that into their um, R session and help you debug it. What's that add on, Kevin? Where, do you have to download that separately or is that already built in to the RStudio IDE? I don't remember if I had to include add-ins, but when I downloaded the package, it came, it came with it. And I don't know if I've already had a, a setting that I had add-ins already or not, but it's super handy. And I'll show you another way to do it from the console too. And there was, and I was expecting when I did that, that another option would some, another option would occur. So I'm gonna try it this way too. Yes. So this gives me a little bit, so it's asking me on the clipboard and I already have one thing on the clipboard. So here you can select the target venue and that's an argument of the function when you do a reprex, GitHub or Stack Overflow, R script, HTML, or a Slack message. And right here, you can also select this button to append the session info so they know what kind of operating system you're working on. So let me try this. And I think I knew what happened. Let's try that. Huh. Huh. I'm frozen. Get out of there. There. I probably should have done this. So we're going to do two. No. So I needed to do reprex clean. Now I can go back. And reprex, um, current selection, and then, and, and then that should work. There we go. So now I have this example right here and I can click down here to get the session info on the operating system that I'm using. And that can make a difference. It knows what packages I have loaded in already. So that helps another person, that helps another person um, help you debug. Go back. Then, on a uh, on a related note, have any of you had issues with Reprex uh, recently not wanting to execute? What do you mean by that? Um, so for work, I work on a remote desktop, and within that, like remote server, um, both myself and another analyst have been getting this error that it throws something relating back to a Pandoc package that might need updated or something. It doesn't do it on my personal device though. Like I was able to just render a reprex just now. Um, if, it's on, if it's on a virtual machine, you probably don't have the underlying software for, for Pandoc installed. Okay, Would it, it was working like two or three weeks ago and then it, we both was got the not, same error. Was there an upgrade wonder, or something? Yeah, I wonder if we just need to update the package or something. Okay, sorry, I won't dwell on that, but I was just curious if anyone else ran into that issue recently. Does, you know, if you guys have used it, please, uh, you know, if I have any other um, experiences using it, or if I'm missing something, please chime in, or uh, um, 
I think every time I, every time I do it, I was telling Colin before we started, you know, you can just be convinced there's a, a, a bug somewhere, but then you realize you're the source of the bug. <laughs> so right. I, I find it every time. And then I'm like, Oh, that was me. <laughs> Go figure. Um, let me do this. I can't. I mean, I'll be, I'll be a hundred percent honest. I mean, this is the first time I've seen Reprex and this is just, yeah, blows my mind. Uh, I'll be honest with you. So, and then I was also thinking about this cause I also teach a class in this as well. I'm going to start telling my students to do this, copy your code, use this little add on, send me your code. So I, yeah. I, this is great. You can also do it from console as well reprex i think and then I think that's all you have to do whoops the nice error code you get is fun are we just going in circles <laughs> it's pretty funny if you read it up top there <laughs> yes yes i am <laughs> yeah <it's... laughs> that's funny reprex clean yeah i mean honestly this is like more than i've seen done with it i've only had to use it for like really minimal stuff and didn't even really use it for the first time until probably a month or two ago yeah it's said, so i'm drawing a blank on how to run it from the console been the add-in is making me lazy i don't there know. might be i think there might you be another step it. you have to do before running that line try it nope first text hmm. i'm drawing a blank on how to run it from the, the console but and Colin, do you have add-ins on your R Studio? I don't know if there's a or any of the I, other guys. I, I I looked at it and I do have it, and so um, you know, do you have I never, the package. I don't have the Reprex package, so I wonder if that gets brought in. Yeah, it does when you install it. Try um, try library Reprex in the console. And then I think execute that and then try the reprex just with no argument. Nope. Hmm. So I think I was doing a clean reprex. Nope. And of course that always works, you know, when you're testing it yesterday, but <laughs> to run for the console, like make sure you show them how to run it from the console but i don't know i don't remember what i'm doing different so um. well i was i was looking at i was looking at the documentation because i was wondering what the inputs were for the argument and so if you look at x it, it says it's an expression if not given if not given reprex looks for code and in input if input is not provided reprex looks on the clipboard I don't know if that helps, but if you look yeah, at that, yeah, so like it, and then um, copy it to your clipboard from the um, from the script, like uh, like right click and copy, and then run reprex. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, it was looking for. An, I think it was looking for an input that we weren't giving it. So good catch. Nice. But that's it. And then you can just copy and paste it into a, um, a GitHub issue or Slack. And the Slack channel is amazing for picking up tips on how to use Shiny and other people's examples. And you can get a lot of help if you have general questions or specific questions. It's just amazing. Sometimes it's over my head. But it's 
fun to look at what's possible. I don't know if you guys are part of the measure Slack too, but that one can be super helpful as well. What is it? Called measure. It's like more broad. Um, like there's, there's, it's not just R. It's like all over the place. Like there's mm. SEM and BI and stuff all in there, but they have a data science channel too. And usually that's where I go if it's like a programming problem. <laughs> Is there any questions? Anything I missed? No, I think I'll have to start using this package now. I look pretty slick. Yeah, the, the add-ins fun and just going through the I think I have never I've never even tried to do a shiny app. I think that would be the most I think doing that's the most challenging and bringing it down to its core elements is probably the most challenging thing, <laughs> but it makes you think, and that's the number one thing, <laughs> the number one goal is to make you think through it. So if that's what, that's what works, but also as you know, the book uh, brings out a good point is that, you know, if worse comes to worse and if you can share it, you can put it on our studio cloud and then you can share it with the whole app with someone else if you had to um, outside of it or come up with them. Um, I, I forgot about that approach too. I thought that was a pretty clever, um, clever approach for debugging is putting it on our studio cloud. I enjoy our studio cloud so much. It's fun to get on it on a Chromebook and <laughs> rip away on some R code. So. Kevin, could you um, sort of clarify it? And so, like, sorry, this is me not being up on this chapter, but what I'm gathering is like, we started off with example one in that script with the full thing. Mm -hmm. And then it looks like the approach they took was to run the code, look at the traceback and see where that error was. And then basically like strip out all of that data frame stuff to get to the broken down version. Yes. Okay. And let's see, I have too many tabs open. Do you, oops, let's, let's go there. Let's see if I missed anything. So I think Shane, I think the also thing too, and I know you're catching up, I think part of the chapter two was also focused on, you know, the first kind of thing, locating where the issue is first. Like yeah. that's, that's like half the battle is identifying where the issue is. Right. And then the second part of it was diagnosing how to solve that issue. And so um, I think with, with Kevin's, it was the reproducible example, but the book also talks about like print debugging. So like doing some observe, you know, using like observe event to see like, what are some of the outputs to send outputs to like logging or like to log what you're doing. Um, the trace back to help you find where specifically in your code it is. And then what we talked about last week was using browser. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with browser, but excellent inter interactive debugging tool that I found very useful. Um, that kind of helps you locate where it's at, but then also um, interact with the specific app in that location as if it was running. And so, um, but yeah, like I said, the book really starts off with like, Let's find it, interact with it to figure out how to solve it. And then if you need help, send it out using a reprex. Gotcha. When you say browser, like a separate thing or like opening it in a browser and then like looking at the DOM tree to see. No, it's like a, offer tools. No, it's yeah. a, it's an, it's an actual function called browser. So. Um, oh, slick. And yes. Do you want to show it Colin? Sure. Because I, I can, can do a refresher on it because I've <laughs> that's a sure. Yeah, sure. I can I can do it. Let me um yeah. let me open my stuff here. Um 
Let me see if I can find my examples here. Could you bear with me here for a second? Make sure I got it. Okay, cool. Yeah, so let me share my screen with you. Um, share screen. I want to go with my third. Okay, so can you see my um, R Studio? Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, we were we were kind of using this app last time. Um, some of it's going to look out of place because I was taking commenting stuff out, putting it out. So I don't normally do the commas here and stuff. So just kind of ignore this, but this app will run. Um, all it is, is just a basic application that I just ask, you know, enter your name, tell us your age, so on and so forth. But what we can do is if we look on the server side and say we would like to uh, stop and interact with what's going inside of one of these render texts, what we can do is we can add a function called browser. So browser. And then what's going to happen is, is that when you start the app or the app initializes, what's going to happen is it's going to kick an interactive shell over in your console that you can interact with some of the internals within your application. So I put it right here on line 21. What's going to happen once I run the application, it will stop right here and put this interactive prompt in my console that I can interact with. So do that as an example right now. Run the app and you'll see that there is just this slight change in my console. You know you're in the browser because you see this right here and you also get access to different tools up top like next, stop, execute the remainder, continue and then stop the whole thing. So now because I'm looking at, now that I'm kind of stopped right here, what I can do is I can start looking at different inputs that I've provided. So if I would like to see what my name input looks like, because I'm in this interactive interactive kind of shell, I can type in input, input, question mark, name. I don't have anything in there right now, but if I wanted to, I could go back to my application that's running here in the background, enter my name, now I'm gonna to have to walk it through cause I just entered that. And so I have to get the app to pick up that change. And so there's a couple ways to do that. Either you can click the next up here or the shortcut is just a little N on your keyboard and enter. And you can see it's walking through the application. And so if I look at it, my input and look at the values, now my name's there. So now you're kind of interacting with the application with the browser. So you can kind of get a better view of what's happening in this location right here. Like, um, yeah, it's, I like, browser's really good. And then, and that, what we talked about last time too, browser's great, even, if, even not in a shiny application, even if you're trying to debug like a function or something. I found it great for like, if you're creating like a helper function for that does like some data, uh, data wrangling, it's great to kind of put a browser there to kind of check step-by-step step what's being changed. If you want to get out of the browser, if you want to get out of this interactive shell, you can either hit stop up here or capital Q and it will stop and you're back to your console or your console and the application is, is done because it stopped. Sweet. Yeah, it's, this is probably when, when I've learned how to do this, it, it helped. The other thing that you can do too, is if you don't want to use browser, like say if you're using like a version control system and you don't want to accidentally push that into a version, into your version control, you can use what are called breakpoints. Um, sometimes most people get, get familiar with these by accidentally clicking them. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> first time I did it, I was like, what's this little red dot? <laughs> yep. Yep. That's, that's kind of your first introduction to it. But uh, the book really talks about that. This is another way to kick off an interactive browser shell is you can click, you know, put a breakpoint here, run it. And what you'll see is it basically kicks you into that browser section, into the, the interactive browser shell. And so That's you can do the same thing that you did. Yeah. It helps. It helps quite a bit. So, um, and I'm sure there's more functionality than more that I showed you, but it works great. The other thing is, is this application that I, this example application, this is when it's working. So this is a working app. So I could show how browser works, 
but you know i could see the value of it if you had like if you're coming across a bunch of errors or something before so right that's cool that's elite mode <laughs> yeah you actually feel like a computer programmer when you open it up the first time right. <laughs> Sweet. Um, cool uh kevin did, did we get through everything yeah <laughs> Okay, cool. Does a, a, any other questions? Uh, I mean, we still have a little, we, I mean, we have as much time as we need. Um, so if anybody has any questions, you know, go ahead or comments or anything. Going once. Nothing off. Well, I, I was just, um, this afternoon I was running into an issue. I put it in the Slack and I think I understand it now. So I do, don't need a full prefix for it. But uh I was trying to figure out how the file input works with Shiny. Um, I can share my screen and, and share what I walked through with myself. Um, Kevin would probably be your guy on this one. I, I haven't used file input, but I can I look at it a, and try I it use a file input. I know that's one of my things I want to... <laughs> To show it for everybody? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to figure out how... Um, there it goes. Why... Uh, so basically, I've got a, a big old CSV in here. It's four gigs. And when I was running my app... Um, I'm, I'm limiting the number of, of rows to read in here, but the end and an underscore max argument. So I put it at 50. I browse to the um, the one like just just this, this is the original one, so one, only eight, um, eight megs, and it's room, so it, it runs it you know fast as can be. Um, Why is it showing showing two rows? No, and now I might need to debug my my uh, pre-producible example here. That's kind of embarrassing. Um, yeah, I don't know why that's two rows. That's not right. Um, But the code is take this numeric input, start at 50. That's the file input. This should be the row count, and this should be like the head of the table. And this should just be the uh, so so it should be taking this. Oh, here it is. Yeah, yeah. I know. Yeah, yeah. That argument is because I, I was messing with hard coding it. That's that's why. Input. There you go. So if you run that again, right, and go back, take the smaller one. It reads it, you know, in like a second because it's room, and that's what it does, right? Fifty rows, you know, hundred rows, like. 110 rows, 1,000 rows, et cetera. I, uh, I made a bigger version of this file by just replicating it 500 times. And, uh, and then, then mapping it or, or, or then binding it and, and running it back. So that's how I made the bigger version, which is the same data 500 times. And then when I try and run that, It shows that the nmax wasn't working the way I thought it was. Because file input has to, it, it uploads the entire file and saves it in memory. And then Vroom reads it from there. So Vroom is not, this is not Vroom working right now. This is file input working. 
and then as this goes, it'll eventually get 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 in, into into the room section of the of the code, and then we can start messing with a number of rows. Um, don't need to see all that right now, but I also wanted to check. Um, I was going to make a README and put this on, up on GitHub, but I wanted to test how it works on local files. Oh, I forgot that I've got my other app running in the background. That's why my consoles. Yeah, that's my fault. Um, but I was trying to confirm my understanding of, of Room and try and try and use it um, just locally, right? So like these each read two rows with room and read CSV. And even reading it from a uh, QRL works the same. So it's not anything with room or read CSV. It's got to be with file input. So I think I'm uh, out of luck in that respect. But that was my process of figuring that out. Huh. And and that, oh, go sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, I was just saying, huh? <laughs> huh. Well, I mean that that's an interesting. I mean that's an interesting thing that you brought up, you know, with you know, uh, you know, with Broom and and bringing data in because I had a, I had like a short conversation on the Slack with I think I think it was Tan, and he brought up an interesting point about this, you know, because. I think Ryan S and I were talking about like taking your computation out of the shiny application, mm -hmm. like as much as you can. And so my thinking was like, it was like, oh, I can't remember my exact thought process, but Tan suggested he's like, well, what you should do is you should think about taking that computation out by creating a separate surface service and then connecting it through an API using plumber. And I thought that was, I thought that was really eye opening, you know, um, because you you have your data available in a format that you need, and it's readily available through the through that API that you created that's already being processed by that service that you've already created on the side. But he also mentioned it, and I thought this was another interesting point, was that doing that as well uh, makes your or makes makes it more accessible for other programming languages outside of Shiny. And so I thought that was interesting too, because he's like, you know, Shiny's great, but if you want to, um, you know, create, and again, I'm, I'm talking like I'm a, a computer, uh, a, a computer program or something, but he's like, if you want to create a Java front end for it, you already have the API built for it rather than just putting it all and just getting stuck in Shiny. But yeah. I don't know if that I don't know if that was related, but I thought that was an interesting point, and it's kind of semi related to. Well, I kind of when you just mentioned that, I saw that thread and was like interested, and then the way you said it just made it occur to me. Like I've always used thought of Plumber as the output of the shiny, not as an input. And I'm like, oh, that's a different frame of reference for me. So that's because I use. Um, I will package up the data. I will package up a shiny app and use, I'll have like a separate script. And I was thinking about using targets, um, but I just will write scripts and functions just to parse the data. And then shiny has the, the data. You save that as an RDA or RDS, um, RDA. And then it's already available for it. And you've done your computation elsewhere out of the app, but that's, that's been my workflow, but I never really thought of the using the uh, API first and then feeding that to the Shiny app, which is making me think. Yeah, I, I think I agree. Like in, in my experience, just understanding the reactive side of this is hard enough. And then if, if you start doing your computation inside your server function, then that just makes it more complicated than it needs to be. So even if I have to do that in, in server, I'll write like more functions than I, than I usually would and use those in the server. So at least 
like it's more concise. For sure. Yeah. Cause I mean, that, that's the issue that we've been having is, is like, you know, at least at, at where I work is the issue is, it's like, how can I put it? It's like, we can make connections to many different data sources, but the problem is we have to do a lot of wrangling to get it into a point where we can actually get any use out of it. And so it's like, well, what we should have is we should have a separate process that processes that data. And, in, in, you know, it's like data engineering. It's not really data, you know, science, but getting it into a format that when you do hook it up to a Tableau or a Power BI or a Google Data Studio, it doesn't have to do a lot of computation to actually get it to work. I mean, you have to do a little bit more. And, and like I said, I'm talking like I'm a computer programmer, so I may be saying stuff wrong. And if I am, please correct me. But um, it, it's more like DevOps stuff, you know, like you have to kind of do like the development before it to kind of like get it to work. Um, do you so have, just, a, go do ahead. have static data or data continuously coming in? Continuously coming in. Yeah, I mean, it, it's But I mean, it's not like to a level of like streaming data, you know, yeah. I mean, it's it's to the point where it's like comes in, you know, every day, every, you know, it could and, and even up to the hour if we wanted it to, but you know, we don't make decisions like that quick, but, um, you know, our solution has been to try and use um, uh, Google BigQuery um, as a backend because I think it's more suited for like a, a like a, an, an, an analytics database. And, but my biggest thing was like, we need to get it into a format that we can use it so that when we do connect it to things like Shiny, Google Data Studio or whatever, it's already done and it's just, you know, it's easy to create, it's easy to create dashboards and stuff if it's, if the data is in a format that you can use. Yeah. So, at least that's my viewpoint anyways. I pull data down from Qualtrics every day and, but it, I mean, I would like, I was thinking about maybe automating it, but I like to see it. I'm still, it's a still small scale and I like to see it before it goes out to, to the client in case there's a, something that's gone awry. So um, I still have that luxury where it's, you know, I'll pull it about five in the morning and then kind of check it, make sure it looks good, then push it up, make sure it still looks good before the client sees it. And then it's great when you get a shiny air at 6.30, right when you're like, I have to go to another job. <laughs> so, oh. What are some of the like wrangling issues that you're running into that you would maybe normally do in an R script, but are trying to do those outside of it so that it's ready for Shiny? Is it like data class issues or like trying to like parse strings and stuff? Or I guess what? Well, it's checking for people will do weird things, of course. Um, like a missing, somehow a, like a missing data entry or a duplicate entry kicks that out or he says it picks the last one i have a script to and uh, the script to get rid of duplicates um and i also test in my shiny app i have a i love the point blank package where it will you make assumptions that there are no missing values for grant for a, a project there's no missing values uh, you're expecting your range, your score ranges to be between zero and six. If there's an exception, it will let me know if there's a duplicate. It'll give me like a nice report of the duplicate entries. I had, I caught one where there was a, because of COVID, different data sources. I had to make a different data source, a uh, long story, but I didn't think to check that they would have the data come in through a paper survey and then one through an online survey. I didn't think there'd be a, like, oh, lo and behold, there is. So, you know, catching that sort of stuff. Gotcha. People do weird things with your data that you can't imagine. <laughs> right. And you probably can't imagine each one of those up front. Probably no. only across it once you throw the error. Yep. And then you just write um, another test for it. And like I'm saying, like point blank will help you figure out, test that. I had the hardest time with test that until I did point blank. And then it all started kind of falling into place. Sweet. 
kind of along what Kevin said too is uh, well, one is table joins. So Jane or you know, joining yeah. two separate types of data that aren't related. So one thing I was doing today was pulling in longitude and latitude for certain cities. Cause we I had a data set that had the cities and had the zip codes and everything, but it didn't have longitude latitude. So I have to pull that in, do those joins. Um <clears throat> the other one. Those table joins, and then I'm trying to think of the other one that I kind of came across today. Sorry, my brain's kind of fried. <laughs> um, I have a big project rolling out tomorrow, so my brain's kind of fried at this. Um, lost my train of thought, so if well, I think of it, I'll bring it up. So the goal is to try to do those table joins outside of the server function then? Yeah, well, that would if be possible. the hope. Yeah, I mean, especially if you like, if you have, this is my viewpoint, and I haven't developed a lot of shiny, so I lean more on Connor and Kevin to, you know, feed into this. But like, if you have just one little small, you know, scorecard that shows one value that you have to join data to actually get that value, is it worth spending all of that shiny computation to actually do that join there when you can do it outside in a separate service and then just already have that value pre populated in a separate table? Right. Hence where like BigQuery would come in then you would just do it in BigQuery. And pull well, that's, that, that's my viewpoint anyways. But again, I lean on Connor or Kevin because I haven't. And I wonder too, the context too, I have the, avail abil uh, the ability and context to just continuously run my data separately and then push it out like an update. But some people may want to be pulling in that data all the time. So I don't, I don't know um in that context but i think you would have to functionize that rather than writing a huge script yeah i would definitely condense that or put it in a function and try and push as much of it outside of the server as you can but then you could also like use the validate function inside shiny oh yeah that's like great. if you're doing joins if you're doing like a filtering join you can validate that you didn't lose any distinct key IDs or anything, or like you can you could validate that you didn't like you have the number of rows that you expected or the number of columns you expected. You do you can do that in Shiny. I never thought of doing it that way. Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Yeah, you just it's the validate function. Yeah, and you tell I use what that for. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I use that in a different context, but I never thought about it in that context i use it to like if let's say i have my kind of like let's say there's no post entry like i tell instead of shiny run into error i just say oh you need to add more data we're still waiting for data or i'll just put like a message uh to the user so there's no some ugly red thing that they don't understand on there I'm right well so validate it does that messaging nice for you so like i've got one where I expect the user to upload, say, like a CSV file. And I've checked the, the file extension in the server function to make sure that it, it is a CSV. And if it's not CSV, I give it a couple, I, get, I give it the message that says, please, please upload a, a CSV file, not you know Excel or something else. I I had an app at work that if you accidentally uploaded an Excel file, it wiped out the database. Whoa. <laughs> Input okay. validation. Yeah. I go, we got to change that like right now. <laughs> Let's go fix that. I wiped out a database. I'm like, sweet. <laughs> yeah. That, that's one of the, one of the oh. big things I, I did at the shiny app that I rolled out, that, 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 that I rolled out for my work is just input validation. Yes. O only accept known good inputs. <laughs> if it's not on this list, it's not getting through. Sorry. Does, does that um, error message that the user gets uh, repeat back to them the file extension that they tried to upload? Say, hey, we need a CSV, not paste in the file extension. Not automatically, but you can tell it to with just like a paste function, like paste or, 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 or str underscore c. Yeah, sweet. You can just construct that. Yeah. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, and it's much more user friendly than that big ugly red text. Right. Yeah. Yes. 
And I, I did actually, and I don't mean to change the, the subject, but it reminded me what I was saying, what I was going to say about the other issue that we have is um, we work with a lot of APIs because we have a lot of third-party services. And sometimes APIs are at the mercy of their data processing, uh, the third parties. And so sometimes you don't get what you expect back. And so you got to kind of work with that as well. So like you want yesterday's data, but they only have data for two days ago. And so you got to deal with that. And so the testing framework, and now that, you know, Connor was saying create a function for it, we could do the testing outside of it, outside of the Shiny app rather than doing it in the Shiny app. You know, that's the other kind of stuff that we were, that I was kind of thinking about as well. How does that testing outside the Shiny app work then? Like, this is something I'm super naive to. Like, is it, can you run a different script and then reference that or do it in a totally different tool or what's, what's that whole scoop? And I'm only speaking to my experience on it, but, uh, and again, this is kind of getting more into data engineering than it is data science, but, and this, again, this is just the way we've been kind of doing it is we've been using, um, we've been using the, uh, we've been using Apache Airflow okay. to monitor and it's, it's, uh, it's a Python software that you can use that's just, just a workflow monitoring service. And we have a separate script that does all the validate, well, it pulls all the data and it validates all the data before it gets written to the actual database that, you know, all of our applications pull from. And so it's like a separate script that we have on the side that does that um, and does all the testing and stuff. And one of those tests is to validate the date. So if we make a call to an API that says, hey, we want yesterday's data, but we got two days ago, you know, two days ago, it fails, logs it, and then retries it rather than, you know, messing up our database and just doing a bunch of du duplicates in it. And so, um, but I am far from a, a good data engineer. So, but that's just the way we found to do it. Um, there's a, if you, within the R confines, there's the test that package. And um, also there's a package called cover page that I love that will send it will, if you run that, it will give you a nice summary of all your tests and the results of your test and a nice markdown report automatically. Okay. I love that package. So you can run your test. You know, when you do test that, you can just test uh, individually. The I'll test the scripts. I haven't gotten into sh testing the actual shiny components yet. And I'm hoping to learn from this book. Is that a package? Uh, Is it a cover page? Yes. CVR page. Oh, and so not spelled out. Yeah, I think. Spell it all funny. So if you, let's say you don't have access to some other outside tool and no other programming language, in theory, could you pull your data in, whether you're using an API or if you've got static data in a CSV or something, do all your cleaning in an R script and then just write that to a new file that then Shiny reads in and do all your yeah. cleaning that way? Yep, yep. Okay, trying to like conceptualize how that flow works, but that, that makes sense now. Yeah, Probably I would- A lot more I'd efficient be... with like a Python script or some other tool that's for that. But if you had to do it all with R, it sounds like you probably could. You 100% you could. Um, I Yeah, I, I would almost never hook Shiny up to raw data that hasn't been processed in some way. Right. Makes it's sense. Just, it's just yeah. it's just asking for trouble. Yeah. Absolute nightmare. <laughs> Debugging fiasco. Oh, but, um, I mean, and too, like, I mean, even, even you could, I don't know if you're familiar with cron, like you could set up cron tasks, uh, depending on your operating system that you're using and whatever operating system you have access to. Like you could schedule your own task using cron if you have, um, if you're on a Unix based system. But again, I'm kind of getting in murky waters with that. I think cron, the problem with that, like if I couldn't do it on my computer because it goes to sleep, but if you have a server, you could absolutely. Okay. And it, so is that just like a task scheduling? Yeah. It's tool? almost, yeah. You just use that to run a script prior to pulling that stuff in. And you can also do oh, GitHub, GitHub Actions, too, is pretty interesting. You can run tests on GitHub Actions. Sweet. 
picking up all kinds of cool stuff here. Yeah, there's a lot of automation services that are out there that are available, both open source and paid. I mean, there's just a there's so many services that you can buy into to do automating and, and workflow optimization and all that stuff. But yeah, I think but to like to bring it back around, like to do all of the non-Chinese stuff outside of Shiny and only do Chinese stuff in Chinese. Okay. As much as possible. Fair enough. That... <laughs> you probably just saved me a ton of headaches. That was why I got, that's why I stopped doing Shiny for a while because I would make like a monster application, but it was just, I was just stuffing like wrangling code in the server. And I was like, why is this so slow? This is, why are people like raving about this? And then I put it down and then I learned that and I was like, oh, I am now smarter for um, taking my computation out of that. So yeah, cool. I did that. My first big shiny app I did, I realized I maybe I shouldn't load the, like the five gig CSV file. I shouldn't put that code in the server. <laughs> Should put it at the top at the, of the UI so that it only runs once. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, not not once every session. Oof. Hey, I have a great, I'm going to send you guys a link to a tweet on GitHub Actions and testing. A great uh, blog post. So let's, see if, let's see how it works. So um, that's a great tutorial on using GitHub Actions to test. So with Actions, does that, okay, so I was reading into Actions the other day. Does it cost money if you're using it for like private stuff? No, not if you're using it too much. Okay. There's a limit. There is a limit, but um, I use it on one. Uh, well, what would be too much, I guess, is the question. Uh, I'm not sure what the – I can't remember the um, the limit, but it seemed like a lot to me. <laughs> Okay, so don't go over the limit. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they'll document, they'll like when you, you can look it up um, and maybe I'll look it up for next time, but it's. Because uh... I was looking at that and I was wondering about it and then it was just like, it's free for open source stuff, but if you start doing it behind like a private repository or something, again, I briefly read it, so I may be misquoting some stuff, but it was like, if you go over a certain amount, then you're going to be charged and I didn't know what the pricing was on it, but. All right, guys, I got a, I got a job here. Damn. Yeah, it's, it's already it's seven. Good. Yeah, gotcha. it's seven o'clock. So I do appreciate everybody. Um, uh, we'll see everybody next week. All we'll right. We'll do chapter six. So have a good night. Cool. See you. Thank you. All right. See you. Bye. Bye.